Hey, welcome to Write More Light. My name is Sarah. I am here with the Midwest Writing Center. I'm excited today. I always say I'm excited, and usually that's true. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I really, I get to choose the things that we talk about, so I'm usually talking about things I'm excited about. Otherwise, why bother? Um, today we're talking about documentary writing, which um, in order to give a better, give better instruction today, I tried to do research on it. Um, and it turns out if you use your favorite search engine to look up documentary writing, people want to tell you how to make documentary films. Well, I'm talking about the day to day. I'm talking about making documentation of uh, making documentation of the everyday of this moment in time. And generally speaking, we call that documentary writing. There are other things to call it, of course. There's um, genres within this umbrella term, um, but I want to be clear that we're not talking about filmmaking. Um, so today, as, as always, the format's going to go intro, that's this right now, um, content, what's up at the Midwest Writing Center, and then a free write. So um, we shall dig in now. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, it's really easy to put documentary writing in under the journal heading and like call it a day, but that's like a huge disservice to all the work that we do that is documentary writing. I am pro journal. I think we should all be journaling and journaling is absolutely documentary writing um, inherently, right? Because we're putting down our thoughts and feelings about this moment right now. Um, even if what we're writing about is what happened yesterday or three years ago, or in 20 years, it is what we're thinking and feeling in this moment. Um, and what's important about it too, is that by documenting right now, what's happening or what's on your mind, uh, we get an idea of what's happening right now, even though you may not be discussing this moment. Um, yeah, so it seems a little silly maybe to to talk about why we want to do documentary writing, um, but but I think that we don't talk about it enough, right? Um, especially when we think about uh, you know like really highbrow literature, we want um, like beautiful words and we want um, universal feelings. But what we forget about is how important it is to know, to know a moment in time. And we absolutely, I don't know, uh, we skip over that. We take it for granted a lot of the time because I think because we take it for granted as, as we exist right now, we just assume that that is known. Um, but you know, in centuries past, the only documentation, the only stuff we know about the past is from the wealthy because those are the people who either had the time or the means or the education to do the documenting or it's them whose belongings or whatever are preserved, right? Because um, the poor either couldn't write or their belongings fell apart or they had fewer belongings or they weren't, um, you know, passed down for generations, whatever it is, uh, put in a museum whatever. Um, and I think in looking at the past, we can see why it may be so important in the future to have some documentation about the present. <laughs> um, that, that all being said, uh, it can also be really, really cathartic to look back at your own work and have this, this confirmation or, I don't know, some realization, some surprise um in regard to what you were thinking feeling going through what the, the tangible facts of your life uh of your life were at that time um moving on i apologize i can't be in my office today again so um so here we are Sorry about that. That was a little embarrassing. It's going to happen again because all I did was move the cat. 
so I apologize. <laughs> um, when we do documentary writing, we are intentionally documenting the events of the here and now. Um, this is partially for posterity, partially for, for accuracy of memory. Um, so sorry. Um, so sorry if you're tuning in at home and witnessing this, this small chaos. Um, we, I know, you know, as, as we get older, we talk a bit about, you know, wanting, wanting our children, our grandchildren to understand what life was like for us. Okay, so, um, but if we think about, you know, um, Anne Frank's diary, which is, you know, one of the top selling books of all time, it's not something that she wrote for public consumption, but it is a really important document that tells us what a, a large swath of people were going through in a very specific time. And those people were not, allowed to speak for themselves at that time. So this becomes very, very important. Um, I think we also take for granted maybe that we aren't living in, <laughs> in historic times or maybe before last year, we, we took for granted that these are, this, is just, this is just time um, and not something big important, not something that we're going to want to look back on and care about, um, which is naive at least because each year has some significance, right? Um, having, having these personal accounts leads to having a really beautiful, maybe not beautiful, a really rich public memory and public history. And um, while I believe that we are all storytellers, that we all have something to share, that we all um, are, are worth writing, each of us deserves our own writing um, or storytelling as it may be. You don't have to write it to be a storyteller. Um, we do deserve that. We um, may not know what the important things are until later. So I'm not telling you, of course, to, to sit right down and spend entire days journaling so that you have every moment documented. Um, but I also don't want you to take for granted the things that, that are happening right now and think that they're not going to matter. Um, I'm sure anybody watching this is aware that like you don't know what things turn out to be significant until later. For example, you know jobs you jobs you didn't get and then later it turned out, you know, that you got a different job because of that and that was good or bad but had a huge impact. Um, the reason I think that it seems silly to talk about why is because it's hard to talk about why. I'm sure that you are noticing that I am struggling a little bit to, um, to, to hit the nail right exactly about why your domestic life matters um, without you know sounding sort of like, we all matter and we're all magical beings. Because that's not the point. The point is um, that having records is important and cool for like, all of humankind. <laughs> um, we talk about documentary writing, of course, like I'm, I was already sort of getting to, um, more in the in the flashbulb moments, right? More in those huge historic events. Where were you during the moon landing? Where were you on 9-11? Where were you when the, the Challenger exploded? Um, and now, of course, we've had this whole, it's been more than a year and a half since last March, where it seems like every single day, definitely every single month, something huge and, and historic happens. And we talked a little bit on Tuesday with our, with our panel about how we're, we're experiencing so much in, in condensed form, rather than, you know, having the events spread out over time, that we may know, we may know that each moment 
or at least, you know, once a month, something really big and extreme and um, impactful is happening, it can be really hard to experience all of these things as they're happening because there is so much. Um, but that's ever more reason that we want to at least have some sort of writing practice for catharsis, for documentation, for whatever reason. But um, it is always going to be left to the folks who did the telling to, to do the telling, right? Um, we can't have stories from folks who didn't tell their stories. And so, um, as we say, you know, the, the victor, the victor tells the story, right? Um, whoever triumphs in the war is the hero. Um, the same goes for, for documentary writing. It's the people who did the writing who have the ability to tell the story. And more important than the exceptional folks are, you know, the normal people. <laughs> Um, not that we're not all exceptional, but we're not all famous, right? We don't all have huge audiences, but we are the people whose stories make up the world. Um, and we're also the people whose stories are probably more indicative, more true to the average. And that's what the real world is experiencing. So if we go, you know, a hundred years from now and we're reading about the year 2020, the year 2021, the year 2016, remember how that was our, a very significant and terrible year for us all at the time. Um, what we're gonna see is like the number one TikTok video. And that's not, I mean, that might not even be documenting anything. That might be a, a prank or whatever. Um, so we need to make sure that we have our stories out there so that it's not the most famous or the most um, clout having who are telling the stories on our behalf. Maybe I just got a little preachy, uh, but I really believe in, in what I'm saying. I really believe in, in us, the, the people living our lives, telling our own stories. Um, it can, I already said that. Um, I've also already said that I am pro-journal, of course, but this is also about more formal writing too. Um, when I say formal, I don't mean like formal dress. I mean, uh, writing that has form, uh, like essays, fiction, poetry, uh, particularly those that deal with domestic life. And I brought an example here. Um, I am not totally sure how to say his name, Mark Ray here. Um, this is a book I read um, I don't know, last year, that deals primarily with domestic life. He is uh, going through life. He's just going through ordinary life and documenting it. And it's really beautiful. And uh, I think that we don't realize it can be because we're just going through it, which, you know, is why poets are so cool. They manage to make anything beautiful. Um, okay, so I'm just looking at, so I often mark my table of contents with favorites. So I'm just looking at um, this one in the first section, as you can see, it's um, divided into sections by uh, phases of the moon. So the first section I have one marked called nightstand, which sounds pretty domestic as nightstands tend to exist in the domicile. Um, I'm gonna read it to you. Forgive me for any um, poor performance or um, mispronunciations. Nightstand. Ground divorces from ground and red from the heart beneath the press that screws with love the apple towards cider. Fragments are left of spectrum when chlorophyll abandons the leaves old yellowing story. Selling dismisses picking. A classic of skyrocketed afternoon becomes lewd interpreted. Her favorite song from childhood dragged through bong water by black light. Midnight, you held me once through the lace veil interrupted by actual touch. What made a recipe for vinegar of if then, therefore N or negative N, some or its homonym. Both cuffs are opened beside the water. Um, I'm not going to investigate that poem and everything that it's doing, but it is of course about having a moment, presumably at the nightstand where you're seeing examples of, of daily life. We 
are looking at, I assume metaphor, but also the very literal uh, picking of apples, which becomes selling and also making a product out of the apple and cider. Um, then after, after talking about picking the apples, turning it into cider and selling dismesses picking, we have a classic skyrocketed, a classic of skyrocketed afternoon becomes lewd interpreted. So after, after we try to interpret it, it becomes lewd. Um, and we talk about her favorite childhood, her favorite song from childhood. We talk about how midnight once held us. It's all really normal stuff, but he does it in such a way that it feels important as we read it. An example of the domestic. <laughs> Um, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this because it's relevant to our forthcoming MWC Press Anthology, These Interesting Times, because every single one of these pieces is a piece of documentary writing, even though probably none of us sat down and thought, I want to write this piece so that someone knows what happened in 2020. I mean, maybe a couple of people did. Um, I've said before, we have a lot of timelines in this book. They start in January, they end in December. They're talking about the year of 2020, but they do it in wildly different ways. Um, we have here, we've got Shishuan Collins, who says uh, her title is What a Lucky Year, which of course is sarcastic. Uh, well, mostly. Um, first line, I know, what am I thinking? Why would anyone whose name is not Jeff Bezos call 2020 lucky? Nightmare, disaster, catastrophe, a glimpse into the apocalypse and the collapse of human civilization, right? So she's got this intro. Um, then on a more personal level, even before the pandemic, 2020 was going already going badly for me when five people I know had heart attacks in the week leading up to Valentine's Day. So she's starting in February, not January. Um, then she moves into March, which of course we all have that flashbulb moment. Where were you when when there was a shutdown. Um, I think that for most of us is, is in March. But we also have um, Julia Barr has Disaster Piece 2020. It just starts out January. I was huddled in a group hug with five complete strangers who had become friends after hiking in the wilderness and spending an evening together in a log cabin. Um, then she skips ahead to April, isolation lost its luster. Um, Julia is a middle school teacher, um, so presumably around March she went on spring break and didn't go back to the classroom. Um, so we skipped, like I said, from January to April. The sky is white even if the clouds conspired to quarantine, as if even the clouds conspired to quarantine. A beautiful line. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm looking specifically at, at Julia's piece uh, is because each section is pretty different, even though it's a timeline piece. Um, in May, the section of the section title is May, the handiwork of one hand with too much time on it written using predictive text. So this is her documenting the month of May. And it says, and it's presumably actually using predictive text. Today's headline, the most important thing to do is drink some bleach and die. Found out about the future of our fit psyches. Sorry. Found out that I have no idea how much I need. Found out the window is open to more than necessary. Outside your window, you find the right now. I'm not going to read the whole section. That's a pretty long piece. Um, but then June, nature needs no audience. It's a poem, this one. So you see May. Ooh, where am I? Yeah, May up here, June down here. Um, I'll read the whole June poem. These trails could transform into tangled twisted vines to bind my ankles. Meteors could burn the prairie wildflowers wafting to ensnare me, leaping barefoot sunset dares me onward home and yet I tarry. Soon the fireflies will flicker, death she waits within the thicket. Worms will churn the earth beneath her, seeds will scatter into ether. Breed these wishes into flurry, watch them settle into nettles. Here she'll stay, all bathed in sky. She's in no hurry, nor am I. Uh, July, retreat and rearrange, just one po paragraph. August, just one paragraph. September, song to sing while hiding from the maskless masses. It's just four lines, a uh, tiny poem. Scream inside your heart, scream together as the world falls apart. Can't stop screaming once you start. Our screams will sustain us like an art form. October, all, also a poem. November, also a poem. December, also a poem. Um, but this, of course, is an example of how 
varying timeline pieces can be. Um, and something that I really like for timelines, there's a lot of timelines in here and I um, only had those two in mind to begin with, but um, we also have Carolyn Rambo has a timeline piece in which she just discusses in short sections, the most significant moments of each month. Um, she's got, in my birthday, she's got Say Her Name. She's got uh, The Worst Is Yet to Come. She's got Remember the Murder Hornets. It's, um, the timeline is a cool thing to do. And the point of showing how many different examples there are of what writing timelines is that you can do whatever you want. And it can be really cool to do this just as a, as a regular practice, right? At the end of each month, you sit down and you say, um, all right, here's my, what is it? it's October, so here's my September section. Um, here's two sentences of what happened in September. And just call it, just call it good. Uh, I think a lot of people with bullet journals do something like this. And um, I think that can be really cool. Um, we also have, uh, you can also do, you know, your favorite quote that may describe the month or your favorite song that, that you first heard this month or the song that was stuck in your head this month. I know some folks who, um, who make playlists like that. They just do their most played song each month and then look back at it at the end of the year. Um, and that counts, that's totally a form of writing, by the way. Um, poetry of routine, saved to-do lists. Saved to-do lists can be really cool um, as found or collage poems. Um, Day in the life stories. Those I think that we forget about a lot because they're not super plot heavy, but as a piece for posterity and also um, for, for writers in general, they can be really cool. Um, exercises in, in style, if all you're interested in is like working on your writing and you just need a prompt, you can do um, day in the life pieces for anyone. I, um, one of my favorite projects that I used to do when, when I was in college and I had an irresponsible sleep schedule, a lack of respect for tomorrow, I liked to call it. I still think that's pretty clever. Um, I would go to IHOP at like midnight, 1 a.m. Um, and I would just choose one of the regulars or one of the staff people and I would write what I called a personality profile about them. It would just be a little vignette um, that I made up about the person. Um, but in doing that, inherently I'm reflecting on what daily life may look like in this time and place. Um, something that's really cool about sci-fi and fantasy writing, sci-fi in particular, I'm not super familiar with fantasy, I confess, is that it is so often used as satire that um, it can easily reflect now, here and now, uh, even though the tech reflected may not, may not be accurate. And sometimes the tech is a really cool, important thing. I would include, you know, like if I were doing a month to month as a time capsule, right? I might say, hey, the, um, what were they called when Google put out glasses? The Google Glass was, came out for sale this week, um, which, you know, no one bought. <laughs> um, but it's a thing that happened, a cool invention that is indicative of where tech was at the time. Um, or a micro, when microwaves came out, that was significant. <laughs> I don't know why that one has been in my head, perhaps because I'm sitting next to a microwave. But um, you know, the different the different tech that comes out, uh, the different appliances that come out are significant and are are shaping our lives in in very real ways. Even though it seems really silly to talk about them in writing, of course, a lot of writing advice goes down to like, don't add a single extra word. Um, every sentence should be pushing your story forward, but. Um, that's great advice. I'm not saying that's not great advice, um, but it isn't always about pushing the story forward as the story is about a moment. It can be easy to take that advice and see only plot rather than the other things that make up story, the moments, the language, people. Those all matter. Um, hmm, let's give some more examples. Um, I grabbed Between Everything and Nothing by Joe Mino. He was a um, Collins Writers Conference faculty member on 
on uh, fiction short story writing this year. Um, this is a nonfiction book, which is written sort of in a timeline, which I think is pretty cool. He interviewed two men. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to say their name right, so I apologize in advance. Uh, Seydou Mohammed and Razakia. And their, their immigration story. And it goes back and forth in time, but it's definitely a timeline. It's also an interview, which is another format that totally works for documentary writing. Um, especially because something that I think is really cool is I read books. Um, when we read really old stuff, well, it's either from oral tradition if it's really old, um, but a lot of the times the only things that came forth were formal. There were rules to what was allowed to be written and read. Um, so when I say formal in this context, I mean fancy. <laughs> um, but of course, later on, we get poetry that was super formulaic because that was what was hip at the time. Um, but when we do interviews, we get an idea of how people speak, which is cool. Um, here's a nonfiction book I'm actually currently reading called Unraveled the Life and Death of a Garment by Maxine, I don't know how to say her last name, Bidette maybe, um, which is sort of a timeline. It is from cotton farmer to discarding your garment. Um, so point of that being anything can be a timeline. It's not, um, it doesn't have to be straightforward. And again, my point being, there aren't rules about how to do this. I just wanna give you ideas. I just wanna see you do it. I wanna see you create. Um, we already know I am a sucker for lists and letters. Uh, I think that there are a lot of really subtle intimacies that are revealed that way. For example, you know, if you're maybe saving your to-do list um, as either a pack rat or someone who's going to use them for found poetry, you know, um, your grocery list may include a specific brand of toilet paper and a note on why, or like a star or whatever, which is gonna remind you, I need to get this brand for this reason. And that is an intimacy that I think we take for granted, right? Um, because it's, it's every day. But in, in a greater context, you know, you buy this brand toilet paper yep, because you've got a sensitive butt. Um, or um, you're caring for someone for whom this is a, um, you know, it's what their mom used and they have very few comforts from home. And you made a note that you, I really wish I hadn't used toilet paper as an example. <laughs> I could have said beans. Um, but you know, having a specific brand that you wanna use can, um, or style or whatever can have a lot of inherent interpretations that allow you to, to see more levels that, you know, we don't see when we're making a list because it's whatever, I just need to go grocery shopping. Um, so I love lists, I love uh, letters. And so I've got the classic, this is an old cover. I, I saw a new cover recently and was uh, impressed <laughs> with mine. Um, this book came out in 1990, like Water for Chocolate. It's written in recipes and I've never tried to cook from it, but I hear that people do. Um, so we've got January, so it's also a timeline. Then it says Christmas rolls. Then we have an ingredient list and then preparation. But of course, this is a novel. So um, she says, you know, this, I'm just gonna read this. Uh, preparation, take care to chop the onion fine, to keep from crying when you chop it, which is so annoying. I suggest you place a little bit on your head. The trouble with crying over an onion is that once the chopping gets you started the, and the tears begin to well up, the next thing you know, you just can't stop. I don't know whether it's ever happened to you, but I have to confess it's happened to me many times. Mommy used to say it was because I was especially sensitive to onions, like my great aunt Tita. Tita was so sensitive to onions. Anytime they were being chopped, they said she would just cry and cry until she was still in my great grandmother's. Uh, when she was still in my great grandmother's belly, her sobs were so loud that even Nacho, the cook, who was half deaf, could hear them easily. So you see how we went from instructions on how to how to chop onions and a, a precaution for chopping onions to a story, super super easily. Um, granted, Laura Esquivel is incredibly talented. Um, but it flowed really naturally as a recipe. Of course, we've all seen recipe blogs where, um, you know, we all, we make that joke about we have to scroll to the bottom to get to the recipe because we're hearing this whole person's like life story about how the recipe came to be. 
but if we're fancy writer people, we incorporate that and we make it a story on its own. Um, I have a lot of poetry books here and um, mm -hmm. let me just see. Okay, so I've got um, In the Language of My Captor, Shane McRae, obviously an extraordinary book, National Book Award finalist. Um, now there's, there's sections, right, which are kind of like chapters um, and they're numbered. That is not, um, that is not a timeline um, just because it's numbered. But, you know, he doesn't have to, he didn't have to have numbered sections. He could have titled his sections anything he wanted. He could have um, not titled his sections, but the third section here, section three, is um, Banjo Yes receives a Lifetime Achievement Award. Then Banjo Yes re recalls his first movies. Banjo Yes talks about his first white wife. Banjo Yes plucks an apple from a tree in a park. Banjo Yes talks about motivation. Banjo Yes asks a journalist. I believe that those are all the first lines of each section. No, they're not. They're actually titles. I apologize. Um, but that's another kind of documentary writing, right? Um, we're talking about a person, so it's um, biographical. But um, it's also just snapshots, right? Um, vignettes about this person or character's daily life. Um, I have here Becca Claver's Ready for the World. Um, I would say that spells are the same as recipes. Um, also prayers can often, prayers that are like formulaic, right? Not me sitting down to say a prayer, which would be more like a letter. Um, they're, they're recipes, which makes them lists. Um, I was gonna see if there was one in here because I didn't actually review this one in advance. I just knew there was something in this book I wanted to go for. Um, and I guess it's the spells, there's a lot of spells in here. Um, I'm just gonna go for, I'll do the first one, Spell for Good Weather, page four. Spell for Good Weather. Please don't rain on our ionic pyrotechnics, our winged pink park smoke. Check the internet against the perfect skies. Why do I have faith in the lightness of the drift when the only thing they've ever been is changeable? Um, okay, that was a poor choice for the example of lists, but um, all the same. This is absolutely documentary, documenting a, a moment in time and that moment in time is wishing for good weather, but in, in this moment in time, right? Um, I guess 20 years ago probably is too recent, but 30 years ago, no one would um, check the internet against the perfect skies, right? I see that it looks beautiful outside, but I'm, I'm gonna see what the internet says. Is it going to rain today? Um, so it's, it's just these tiny moments that give us this place in time. Um, I also have speeches, which of course are written for significant moments or in hopes of becoming significant, but um, speeches and sermons are also letters and always, always reflect a moment in time. I really love sermons. Um, I see them as letters. I see them as essays. I'm not a particularly religious person, but um, but I read them a lot because they can be so beautiful. And of course they are documentary and that is something that I care about. Um, there's, sorry, this was like a bargain book at a Borders many years ago. I um, got for my dad for his birthday or a holiday and then obviously stole because it's mine now. <laughs> but we've got, um, it starts with Moses. And we've got, of course, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. We've got Abraham Lincoln, we've got Murray Curie, we've got Vladimir Lenin, um, Franklin Roosevelt, and these are all obviously direct address. I'm speaking to you, I'm giving a speech, um, but they're letters and they're reflecting a moment of time. So if there's a speech you like or a famous person you like who has given speeches, that's a great reference point as well. Um, there's one more book I brought as an example, which is All That Might Be Done by Sam Green. Um, Samuel Green was a longtime poet laureate of the state of Washington, an incredibly, incredibly talented man. Um, he's still alive. He's just not poet laureate anymore. That was a scary moment. Um, and all of his stuff is super domestic. 
and um, always about daily life. And because he's so much older than me, uh, he grew up in a different world from me, right? So the very first poem in this book I have, I'm gonna actually skip to one I really, really love instead of, um, instead of the first poem in the book, I, I was just gonna stick with doing these, these early pieces, but um, my mother fetching a switch. He has a lot of these, which are um, a, a person and their relation to me doing a thing. And that's a, a thing, that's a whole style. Um, so there's also my father burning his mother's underwear, grandmother cleaning a rabbit, um, old man at the dock, that's not quite the same, <laughs> person doing a thing. So we're doing um, my mother fetching a switch, page 24. Oh, this is longer than I thought, but it's really beautiful, so bear with me. My mother fetching a switch. By now she knows that just because it's thin doesn't mean it won't hurt, that green is better than dead and dried. She needs to choose between the hot sting of a wasp or a dull deep ache that lasts for days, bruises the color of certain pears when they ripen. There are the canes of big leaf maple, willow, alder, the straight suckers from apple or plum in the orchard. She knows to peel bark from the wand and shave the nodes flush to the stem with whatever knife she's given from pocket or drawer, her kitchen drawer. Her first switch left her bloody, then a tiny web of white scars, fine as lace and the doilies her sisters sometimes help her make. Once she, once she brought her father a long whip of pussy willow with the soft toes of catkins left on, he laughed so hard he let her off. A second try made him madder. Once she split a thin strip of cedar from a shake bowl, lighter than the lathe. Her mother used the edge of, like a dull blade. She knows to lift her dress waist high, Overalls unsnapped and dropped to her ankles. Her father likes her folded across a single knee and only strikes the cheeks of her fanny. Her mother takes her standing feet apart and wails at any skin she sees, calves her inner thighs. She knows if she cries or squirms, the blows come faster, last longer, how anger travels into rage. She knows exactly how long she has to find and shape and fetch a switch to its waiting hand. My grandparents think she's learning the wages of back sass, what happens when you ride the stubborn donkey of disobedience, but she is learning how short the pleasure is when she flushes a rabbit from the brush, that there isn't quite time to wholly peel and eat an apple before someone will come looking for her, that no joy lasts long, that father, mother, lover, it is painful to be alive. And all she can do is choose between one hurt and another. So what gives this, its power is, is the universality of it, of course, but um, he's also documenting a time, right? We don't all have trees in our backyard from which we pick the right branch to be whipped with. Um, but that was much more common in a time when more people were whipped and more people had yards. Um, the one I was going to read is the first in this book, Grandmother Cleaning a Rabbit, which is um, why I was talking about how he lived in a different time from me, um, because we don't eat rabbits very often. <laughs> um, his grandmother um, made him go out hunting for rabbits and then she would skin them and cook them. That's why I was saying about the documentary. He has lived a much longer life than I have and therefore um, the documentation of his earlier years is very different and important for documentation. And if we go back and we want to look at how or whether life was different in a different time, we can look at poetry, we can look at fiction. Um, I didn't bring any fiction. Oh yeah, I did, the Like Water for Chocolate. Um, but they're all, they're all ways of doing it. So the important thing, if you want to be writing for document, documentary purposes, um, documentary purposes, um, is to just have those small noticings, those, those little moments, or, um, you know, nouns, the, the general nouns of, of your home. Like you can see my uh, cereal containers there. Those didn't exist for other generations, but the tea box did. That's something I inherited. 
Um, so that is my talk on documentary writing. I hope that it has given you a little bit of faith in, in the concept. Uh, I hope that you know that I believe in you and your story and that it should be told. I know that it was not my most coherent uh, lesson because it was more about passion and feelings and art than about um, tiny, tiny tips and how to's. But my point is more than anything that you should document um, and that there are not rules about it. But if you want to be, if you want your writing to be of a documentary type, you can add that in later or you can add that in by just describing objects or, or moments, especially when, you know, um, this book, the Sam Green book is relatively new. Looks like it came out in 2014, or at least I bought it in 2014. That's what the, um, the sticker, those have dates on them. Um, it, um, you know, so he, he was not a child when he wrote that, but he probably realized, I mean, he probably had a lot of feelings about his grandmother. He definitely had a lot of feelings about his grandmother cleaning that rabbit and he had memories of shooting the rabbit or he wouldn't have written it. But he also knew this isn't something that people do very often anymore and it is worth documenting. We don't get that a lot because um, he, he's from a working class background and those people didn't get to tell their own stories until relatively recently. Um, I'm sure if you hang out with me watching these videos very often, you know that there are tons of working class writers and um, I often prefer them. I, I think the stories are gonna be more interesting if they're not about people without troubles. Um, it's not to say people don't have troubles if they're not from working class backgrounds, but um, historically the aristocracy is where we're getting our stories. So um, yes. Please write. <laughs> now for the next section of our video, what's up at the Midwest Writing Center? Okay, on um, what are we doing here? Next, <laughs> I have a calendar. In front of me. Um, next Thursday, we're gonna have another panel with contributors to um, these interesting times, which I've now buried under a stack of books. And it's going to be at least as cool as the last one we had on Tuesday, which honestly, I wish we could have done for hours and hours. It was so wonderful. Um, so we're gonna have different contributors talking, answering similar questions, but of course I'll, I'll um, cater it to their own pieces. Um, and we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about documentary writing, but we're also gonna talk about um, their writing. We're gonna talk about 2020. We're gonna talk about well, stuff we talked about Tuesday. Watch Tuesday's video, then you'll wanna watch next Tuesday's video. <laughs> Um, then next Thursday on Write More Light, I'm going to talk about dialogue. That's something that I know a lot of people have a hard time with and, um, and don't want to, especially if you're a fiction or, especially if you're a fiction writer, but um, nonfiction writers deal with dialogue plenty, poets deal with dialogue plenty, but um, in fiction we have a lot more conversations between people and we want them to sound real, so important there. Um, Saturday, the 16th, we have Writer's Studio that happens the first and third Saturday of every month from 11 to 1 central time. That is our workshop group. People of um, all experience levels are obviously welcome. Um, we have a really casual, a really kind workshop group. It's just critiques and, and community. Then um, the 19th, we're going to have Shi Shuan back on for the anniversary of um, Flowing Water, Falling Flowers. Let's see, I'm going to get into more exciting things. Um, we are, of course, later going to look at why does this piece of writing work? We're going to talk to um, Tamara Felden of the Artsy Bookworm, the new bookstore in Rock Island. Um, we're going to talk about horror writing, obviously, Halloween. Um, then um, we've got our Foster Stall chapbook release party. That'll be November 11th at Roz Talks. Um, you can pre-order the chapbook right now at mwcqc.org slash books. 
Uh, you can also pre-order the, these interesting times anthology, but unfortunately I don't have a release date yet on that. Still recommend it. Pre-orders, um, pre-orders are live. It's an awesome book. Um, but as, as everything has slowed down quite a bit uh, in the last year and a half, so too has our, um, the production of books. Um, coming up in December and January, we're gonna have a book binding workshop uh, with Andrea Jacobs. We're going to have a um, heart work workshop with Tanea Winder, who is an amazing and pretty famous poet. Um, that'll be for femmes only. Um, it will be really amazing. I haven't had the pleasure yet to take a workshop with her, but I have read her work. I have um, hosted her readings. I have seen the um, activism she does. I've seen her TED Talks. I think it's going to be a really, really special experience. Um, that's all I'm gonna give you for now. And um, now we've got your free write. So we're putting five minutes on the clock. I don't have my phone with me, which I usually use as a timer so I can use my computer. Um, I would like you to write a day in the life piece. It can be a poem, it can be a to-do list, um, it can be a journal, of course. Um, but that is your prompt today. Uh, if you're gonna take off now, please write more light into your life. I'm gonna get to my free write. I've chosen to do a to-do list, um, kind of partially to prove a point. <laughs> um, also partially because I need a to-do list. It can be cool. Um, I know I've said this a lot today, um, but just documenting daily life is cool. Um, boring conceptually, but in practice, it's really cool. <laughs> Um, part of this too, I'm writing down, um, like I wrote breakfast. Um, I'm also writing down what I think would be a proper breakfast, um, which, you know, I've already had breakfast today and it was a bagel, but um, that too says plenty about who I am in this moment, right? Um, someone else may have a full breakfast. I had a bagel. One more minute.
<laughs> this was not the naughty one from the beginning. It's Jupiter, one you do not often see. Okay, and time is up. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope that, uh, like I said, I hope that you have a newfound respect for documentary writing. And as always, please write more light into your life.